Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Early Asimov, Volume 2, by the one and only Isaac Asimov. I've previously reviewed The Early Asimov, Volume 1. Basically, uh, they split it into three for the paperback release. So the hardback, there's just one book called The Early Asimov, I guess. But uh, due to uh, old school printing times and whatnot, I guess, I guess it just costs too much to print a longer paperback than like 240 pages. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and share some of my uh, like bits that I tabbed out, and then I'll give you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, in the late 1930s, a new young talent began to make his mark on the science fiction scene with a succession of outstanding stories in the various SF magazines of the time. His name? Isaac Asimov. He was later to become world-renowned as the author of such classics of modern science fiction as the Epic Foundation trilogy and the robot stories in which he formulated the now famous Three Laws of Robotics. The early Asimov, published in three volumes in Panther Science Fiction, is an unsurpassed showcase of the storytelling brilliance of the young Asimov. Each story is prefaced by Dr. Asimov with fascinating biographical details of how and when he came to write it, as well as his own critical evaluation of it. The result is a doubly rich science fiction treat, a collection of tales that makes engrossing entertainment in its own right and, in addition, gives the reader a first-hand look at the development of the 20th century's undisputed grandmaster of science fiction. So, uh, we have an introduction, then the stories we have are Homo Sol, half Breeze on Venus, The Imaginary, Heredity, History, Christmas on Ganymede, The Little Man on the Subway, The Hazing, Super Neutron, Not Final, Legal Rights, and the amazingly titled Time Pussy. Is that about you, Biggie? You the Time Pussy. Oh, and the pages have started falling out of it. Well, I guess I'll just lift this bit up for now, that'll... <laughs> we get this, which I think is um, very, like, relatable today. <laughs> if you... uh, what do you want now? It was the calm, impersonal voice of the receptionist below that answered him. A message from the government, sir. Damn the government! Tell them I'm dead! Should we tell them that I'm dead? Will that get me out of paying taxis? taxes, do you think, Biggie? And taxis, too. I like this, uh, in one of the introductory essays, Asimov says that what's more, Poles magazines were doing so well that his budget had been increased and he was able to pay me five-eighths of a cent a word for it, $62.50. That's a very specific rate to pay. I charge $5.50 per thousand words, so 5.5 cents. Oh, and we get this little conversation here. Henry's chest deflated with an audible gasp. He frowned. Very funny. And I on my best behaviour too. He drifted away, brooded sulkily a while, and then addressed the trees in a distant manner. Which reminds me that tomorrow is Daphne's birthday. I promised her a present. Get her a reducing belt, came the quick retort. Fat thing. Who's fat? Daphne. Oh, I wouldn't say so. He considered matters carefully, one thoughtful eye upon the young girl at his side. Now my description of her would be, should we say, pleasingly plump, or maybe comfortably upholstered. She's fat, Irene's voice was suddenly a hiss, and something very like a frown wrinkled her lovely face. And her eyes are grey. Then he's like, oh, of course I prefer skinny girls any day. I think we should stop the fat shaming, mate. Not that Asimov really knew much about women. I, th I think he's just imitating what other people said, to be honest. Yes, and imagine that, getting somebody a fat reduction belt as a birthday present. Yeah, I love you, fat bitch. <laughs> no offence meant to any fat bitches. I am one of them. This bit made me chuckle. Uh, this guy goes, are you sure you haven't been seeing things? I remember, I remember once, Henry, when you sighted a meteor in space, scared us all to death, and then had it turn out to be your own reflection in the port glass. Sounds like the kind of thing that would happen in Red Dwarf, which is one of my favorite comedy shows. And then um, we, get, we get this interesting little bit where we kind of discover these aliens and we get, it's the dearest little thing. Look at its funny little mouth. Do you want to hold it, Henry? Henry jumped backwards as if stung. Not your life. I'd probably drop it. I think that's a very understandable reaction to have. That's what my reaction would be. Baby or alien, either way, same reaction. Uh, we get a story called The Hazing, which is inspired by like American universities and the tradition of hazing, which is very not cool. Uh, and in this story, we get a neuronic whip, that pleasant little weapon that paralyzes the vocal cords and twists nerves into so many knots of agony. Ow. And just the last thing I wanted to mention here is in uh, Legal Rights, which he co-wrote with James McRae. Uh, and that story's interesting because it goes towards like a legal case where a ghost is in it as well. And it's determining whether the ghost gets squatter's rights in the place he's haunted. 
Overall, I did enjoy uh, the early Asimov Volume 2. I think because it was a little bit longer than the first one, it kind of suffered because of that. Um, it's not that the stories weren't good, it's just that by the end I was ready to finish it. My copy also fell apart as I was reading it, although I can't really hold that against it. Overall, I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. It was pretty good. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Early Asimov Volume 2 by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.